Hello everyone, I'm Bishop Keith Ackerman and I'm delighted to be with you today. In case you haven't noticed, the church is in turmoil and in chaos. And oftentimes people have come up with ways in which they can correct chaos. The tragedy is that there are many people who are what I would call gold natures. And that does not mean to say that they're over the age of 65. But it means that they really think that there was a golden age in the church when everything was perfect. Oh, for example, they go back to the Acts of the Apostles and said, no chaos there. Well, think again. Then they go on and look at some of the epistles. No chaos there. Well, what about the revelation of St. John the Divine? No chaos there? Of course not. You and I have always lived in an age of chaos and crisis because we're human beings. But it is also true that the church and her wisdom over 2,000 years has found ways to deal with chaos and crisis. What we discover, though, that occasionally there are people who think that they have a better plan. And this is what some of you have heard me call Neo-Mormonism. It works like this. Nothing of any value happened in the Christian church after the death of the last apostle until, then you fill in the blank, Calvin, Cranmer, Ackerman. In other words, we all have our golden ages and those people who are the defining moment. But the reality is that that's a type of arrogance. It's to say that the Holy Spirit took a nap for a long time and nothing of any real worth happened until, let's say, the 16th century. Well, that would be to deny some of the great saints of the church. St. Francis of Assisi would have never existed. St. Teresa, go back and look at the Desert Fathers. And so what we oftentimes find ourselves doing is looking at the church in chaos and crisis and saying something like, well, maybe we ought to call another meeting. And you know how effective that is. After you call the meeting, that is after you've cleared everybody's schedule to find out when they are available, you know, like at four in the morning, the only time when they might be available. Uh, and of course, that would mean that you've taken into account all the time zones. You recognize that it's not as simple as it sounds. In the course of 2000 years, we have had three very distinct ways of handling crisis and chaos in the church. The first, and the one that is the oldest, would be called conciliar. That, of course, comes from the councils. Here we have people who love to have debates over the number of the councils that there were. There are some who say that there were only four. There are some who say there were seven. It's not unlike the people who sit around and argue about whether there's two sacraments or seven sacraments. Uh, to be really blunt with you, I don't have enough time to argue about how many sacraments there are because I'm too busy celebrating them to sit down and have that discussion. And as to how many councils there have been, well, for some who believe there's only four, then I'm happy for them. For those who believe there's seven, I'm happy for them. But it would be to say, perhaps, that those things which are not acknowledged therefore have no value. That would be a little bit like somebody who has done honest Bible study saying there's an Old Testament and a New Testament, and the Old Testament does not include the deuterocanonical books. It would be like saying that God didn't breathe upon those people because I decided he didn't, or somebody I like decided they didn't. But you see, that's the beauty of the conciliar mode. We take into account the holy wisdom of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that means that the church is brought to an understanding of faith on the basis of the people gathering together. Now, I, I know what some of you are going to say. How do you get them together? Just like I said, it's difficult to have a meeting. Well, you'll notice in the first ecumenical council, that was fairly simple because the word ecumenical comes from the word oikumenal, which would be world. So getting the worldwide Christians together in, in the first century was not all that difficult. It became a little bit more complex as we look at some of the different councils of the church as they proceeded. And then after division and splitting after the great schism, even more difficult to get Christians sit down because it's like any family. Anytime somebody is unhappy with another member of the family, they refuse to go to the family reunion, which means that those who don't go get to criticize those who do go. Those who do go get to criticize those who don't go. If that takes place in a natural family, we should not be surprised when it takes place 
in the body of Christ, the family, because after all, they are the same people. Now, what does that mean for us? The conciliar mode means that what we do is we go back and learn and identify what the church has always believed. We can see that in particular as we look at the Vincentian Canon. The Vincentian Canon translated from the Latin, and it's better in Latin by the way, but the Vincentian Canon effectively means that which has been taught in all times and all places by all people. That which has been taught or believed in all times, all places by all people. Meaning that would be the universal or Catholic understanding of faith. We see this articulated, for example, in the Apostles' Creed. Even though the Apostles' Creed wasn't written by the Apostles, you understand. And we see it in the Nicene Creed, even though the Nicene Creed wasn't actually written at the Council of Nicaea. Nonetheless, it reflects the spirit of both the Apostles in the former and the Council of Nicaea in the latter. Similarly, if one looks at the Third Star Creed, the Athanasian Creed, we are able to see that while it was not written by Athanasius, it certainly does reflect the councils of the church that were surrounding the idea of an articulation of what we mean by the holy and blessed trinity, by the two natures of Christ, and what it is that all of us should believe in order for us to be Christians. The second mode that seems to have arisen it was somewhat political. That is, who gets to say who's right and who's wrong? Well, any family has that problem. In fact, isn't it interesting to know what happens when the patriarch or matriarch dies? Suddenly it looks like the family scatters. There isn't a family reunion. Things are different at Thanksgiving and at Christmas. And suddenly we find a whole new dynamic. It was that way in the church too. When suddenly the great leaders were gone, keeping in mind that many in the early church thought that Jesus would return in their own lifetime, they are now left with the dilemma of how they're going to resolve their conflict. So in some families, dad stands up, he slams his fist down on the table and he says, I'm the boss, I get to tell you the way it is and I will interpret what this family believes. You must admit, that is one way of resolving chaos. It may create a whole new chaos, but at least it handles the issue for the moment. Sometimes it's even articulated this way to a child. As long as you live in my house, you will live under the rules of this house. And if you don't like the rules of the house, then you can leave any time that you want to. Well, although this is going to sound very critical, that is not unlike the magisterial mode. That is where the reality of authority rests in the teaching authority. And at least in some of the magisterial forms, that rests in the person of a patriarch or a particular leader. Whereas the conciliar mode seems to take advantage of the fact that we, for many, many centuries, function in what we call primus inter pares, primus inter pares, as you know from the Latin, first among equals, which meant that all apostles and thus their successors, bishops, had equal power as related to their holy orders, but they had different areas of responsibility. And the one who had the greatest responsibility, perhaps because he was the bishop of the largest uh, diocese or the largest see, as we would say, uh, was given special authority, not unlike the Archbishop of Canterbury, who has no more authority than any diocesan bishop and is in fact a diocesan bishop, but is primus inter pares. When he gathers with all the bishops of the Anglican Communion, he's the convener, if you will. Then there's the third mode, and that is the more recent one, and that is called the confessional mode. Now, oftentimes we're confused by that because when we talk about the word confession, people think of it as being one of the sacraments, if they're of the seven sacrament institutional way of thinking. Uh, but we also recognize that we will note saints who are oftentimes called confessors. Does that mean that they spent more time in the confessional box than anybody else? Well, of course not. It means that they confessed the faith. They proclaimed it. And so it is with the confessional mode. There are those who have come up with uh, points uh, of uh, various documents that they believe express the nature of their faith or the nature of their beliefs. And whenever they want to argue a point of view, they go back to their confessional statement, the Augsburg Confession, just to use as an example. And as some people would say, although I think it's debatable, the 39 Articles of the Church of England. 
Now, what does that mean? It means that in every instance when there is crisis and chaos in a family, we have to come up with a way of being able to handle it or else it results in divorce. And that certainly is to be seen in the church because what the church has been dealing with in 2,000 years is a series of crises, a series of chaos, and then ultimately in many instances a, a series of divorces. Uh, much of what we call denominationalism today was would have been unthinkable in the early church. They would never imagine that there would be so many different ways of expressing the faith. And yet what I find among Christians that is very fascinating is that whenever they begin to talk about Islam, uh, they operate as if there's only one expression of Islam. They seem very shocked when they find out how many different expressions of Islam there happen to be. Well, can you understand that Muslims are also confused by us? Because we have so many different expressions. How would you explain to somebody who lives in Iraq, for instance, what the difference is between um, Christian church disciples of Christ and a Presbyterian? How would you explain it? But for us, all these differences are very significant. Now, many of us around the world, bishops around the world, have had opportunity to know that we are living in an age of crisis and chaos in the church. This is obviously to be noted in the world because there is no such thing as a clean delineation between the sacred and the secular. One might be able to say they live in the sacred realm, another might say they live in the secular realm. But a lot of the difficulty in the church today is because we don't know what to do with the secular when it mixes with the sacred. And similarly, what we are discovering all too often is that the secular doesn't know what to do with the sacred today, witnessed in schools, witnessed in many institutions today. And so I want you to ponder that with me for now. I want you to think about how you handle chaos in your lives, how you handle chaos in your families, and how you handle chaos in your churches. The next time, I would like to throw out what I consider to be a rather exciting idea and an opportunity.